Greetings to everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So thankful that you uh, tuned in and uh, we're able to do this electronically. Thank God for technology. This is now our eighth Lord's Day in this COVID lockdown. Of course, the good news is now that uh, President Trump has actually deemed churches and church meetings essential. Thank the Lord. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so great. So uh, we're just so thankful that we have the liberties that we have, able to share the gospel and God's word the way we are with technology, as well as uh, hopefully soon meeting together in churches, as well as giving out, you know, the word over that, over technology. So thank the Lord for all these things. We're so thankful for uh, this. Just uh, Can we just pray for us a moment? Father, just thank you again. For this great Savior, the Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to send him from glory above to die for sinners like us that were lost, lost, and that um, he was willing to take our place in sin and death and judgment so that we could be saved. We thank you for this great Savior. We pray for help now that our lives would reflect our position in Christ free, sinless, um, joy, peace, and love. We just pray for this, Father. Pray that you'd use your word to speak to our hearts in uh, going forward. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So uh, this morning's theme really is going to be about fear, and the text, if you'd turn there with me, is going to be uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. So if you turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and um, you know what? Get a marker because, well, um, like a, a piece of paper or something, because I'm going to turn to another uh, scripture in Proverbs soon, so you can go with me. But um, be sure you have your highlighters, your pens, your markers, be able to mark your Bible, and uh, we'll get started. So again, um, the message really is this morning is about fear. If people that don't know the Lord have a lot to be afraid of. They have the fear of death, the Bible calls it. The fear of death hanging over their lives always. They don't know what's going to happen. Some think some bad things, some think some good things, like we'll all get to heaven, but the Bible says certain judgment awaits those that die without Christ, that have rejected Christ. And if they've never heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ ever in their lives, Nature, God says, is made clear to them that there is a God, a sovereign God, and if they reject this, reject his testimony to them, there is certain judgment to come. Now, for those, uh, so if, if you know, you're wondering about where you stand with God, that needs to be settled first, first, first of all, the most important decision you could ever make in your life is where you stand with God. You need to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and uh, go on from there. We, you know, Debbie and I say this to, you can say this to anybody. God loves you and he has a good plan for your life. That plan starts with knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. So what about us that, um, that know the Lord Jesus? Um, can we still have fears? We certainly can. Because, you know, even though we're saved, headed for heaven, the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. We still have our old nature with us as well. And we don't have to obey it. We don't have to do what it says. But sometimes we listen to the wrong thing in our minds. We listen to that old nature. The old nature says you need to be afraid. Afraid of, of maybe not death. Well, see, even some saints are afraid of death. Some people say, well, I'm not, it's not death that I'm afraid of. I'm just afraid of being there when it happens. You know, we're not looking forward to that experience. But, you know, just think about this. You close your eyes in this sin-sick world where there is misery and failure. You close your eyes here in death and you open your eyes in glory in heaven where there is nothing like that. Only, only, only blessing forever. Blessings forever with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven forever. That's a pretty incredible thought. And uh, certainly that is uh, our hope. So now that you're in 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, what about, instead of the fear of death, what about the fear of life? What's, you know, being uncertain about the future? What's going to happen next? You know, we were living some pretty fearful times. There is so many people right now so afraid and anxious, believers and unbelievers as well. They're afraid to leave their houses. You know, we've seen we've seen some pretty crazy things happen recently. We've seen like an attempted coup, political coup on our duly elected president, you know, that failed. And then we see this this COVID virus spreading across the world and affecting us and people dying. We get afraid about that. And now this pandemic, you know, and, and are being orchestrated to destroy our economy. What's going to happen next? You know, people can be very anxious and very fearful about that. Um, the good news is we don't have to be at all. And that's what I want to focus on today. But turn with me, now that you've got your place in First, Second Timothy, pardon me, I want you to turn to Proverbs. I want you to uh, turn to Proverbs, keep your finger in uh, Second Timothy, but turn to Proverbs chapter 29, because I want you to find this. I want you to mark this verse. Mark this verse in your Bible. It's, it's, it's important to do that, to find these things when you need them. More importantly, <laughs> put it in your mind. Put it in your computer. Put it in your memory bank. Okay? Chapter 29, verse 25. In King James, I'm reading, The fear of man bringeth a snare, a trap. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Thank God, if you put your trust in the Lord, you will indeed be safe. So uh, uh, here's a modern translation. Don't fall into the trap of being a coward. Trust the Lord and you'll be safe. Isn't that simple? It is, that, is the, that is like uh, the entire Bible. It's usually very simple. It's just hard to do. And uh, that is not so hard to do if we would just learn to you know, submit to God. So uh, let's move on. Uh, first, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 1.7. So now that you're there with me in 2 Timothy, Paul, obviously the writer, Timothy is the, um, his son in the faith, and um, Paul is trying to encourage Timothy. Now remember, um, this is later, this is at the end of Paul's life. This is the last thing he writes. This is his swan song, as you would say. This is his deathbed confession, basically. Second Timothy. Um, as you recall in Acts, when Paul has done his first and second and third missionary journey, and he's going back to Jerusalem to keep the feast, and everybody says, oh, no, don't go. They're going to kill you there. No, don't go. And the Holy Spirit tells him, don't go. You're gonna, they're going to kill you there. He says, I'm not only willing to go. I'm willing to give my life for my countrymen because I, I, I want them to be saved. So he goes back. Sure enough, he gets, you know, uh, uh, they, 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 they tell a lie. The Jews tell a lie about Paul. He's brought a Gentile into the temple. He gets arrested and he asserts. But, you know, they're about to kill him. And the Roman guards come and save his life. And he asserts his Roman citizenship. He does that several times in Acts. He asserts his Roman citizenship, talks to the commander in Greek, says, you know, I'm a Hebrew, can I talk to the, you know. And so then he starts talking to them in Hebrew, this huge mob of people that are ready to kill him. All of a sudden, it's quiet. He starts speaking to them in Hebrew, their mother tongue. And you could hear, I'm sure he could, it was so quiet, he could hear them breathing. And he tells them a story how he used to persecute Christians this way that he persecuted. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, relentless. And so... As he's doing this, you know, they're following along about his appearance of Christ to him. And Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecuting. And, and then he follows him all along. The, this crowd is with him all along until he mentions sharing this gospel with the Gentiles. Woo, man. So now they're ready to kill him again. So long story short, he's arrested. He starts this long, long journey, years long journey to get to Rome because he appeals to Caesar because he asserting his Roman citizenship, he appeals to Caesar because he knows the Jews will kill him unlawfully if he doesn't do this. So, and <laughs> it's part of his journey. 
God said when he saved him, he's going to send him, you know, as a light in the world to open the eyes of those that are blind and to draw them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And he's going to send him before the Gentiles and kings. Well, guess who the biggest king is? It's Caesar. So Paul, this is part of God's plan. And, and Paul's not fighting that. Sorry that he's arrested and all the troubles coming near-death experiences on just on the journey to Rome. It's all part of God's plan. Having some hard times? Just remember, whatever is happening to you, God can use that for your good and for his glory. Isn't that incredible? That's a sovereign, good God that we serve. Thank the Lord. So, long story short, he makes it to Rome, and, you know, he's basically acquitted for this crazy, trumped-up charges. Well, guess what? Many years later, he's still preaching the gospel, and he's arrested again, and he's in jail in Rome, and now he's writing. There's the, you know, the prison epistles that Paul wrote as a prisoner. He's in prison now, and now he says, I'll just, just you know, read with me real quick. He says in chapter 1 verse um, go to verse 8 be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord nor of me his prisoner he's in prison I want you to go to uh, mm, go to chapter 1 verse 16 Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain Onesiphorus was one of the few people, if anybody else, one of the few people that wasn't afraid to go and find Paul in a Roman prison because everybody else was afraid to show their face around Romans. Onesiphorus, you know, wasn't afraid, went and found Paul in the prison, in a Roman prison, and encouraged him and refreshed him. Verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even, the, even unto bonds, chains. But the word of God is not bound. He's in jail. He's in prison. And then I want you to just read this last thing with me. This is like a, a, a flyover of 2 Timothy. Go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready. This is Paul's. These are Paul's last words, you know, that we have. For I am now ready to be offered... And the time of my departure is at hand. Um, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed into Thessalonica, Crescents to Galatia, Titus unto Nemesia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Remember Mark? We won't go into that story, but another, you know, Timothy, Mark, these men came from godly families. There's no price that you can put on godly families. Trust me. World changers. Now, uh, uh, um, Mark, and bring him and with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry and uh, so on. So these are Paul's last words. Now, just keep that in mind because he's writing to Timothy and Timothy is sort of like to take up, you know, where Paul left off his ministry. And Timothy can be referred to as sometimes, I'm not trying to knock Timothy, but he's, the, he's like us. He's like us. Uh, um, you could refer to Timothy as timid Timothy. And Paul says, um, verse 5. Mm, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, again, godly family, godly heritage, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. Verse 6. Wherefore I put the remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which was in thee by the putting on of my hands. Timid Timothy. He needs to be encouraged. Don't we all need to be encouraged? Trust me. We all live here in this crazy world, and we all falter. We all need encouragement. Amen? Now, verse 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. This is the good news. We're not of this world. 
Satan is not our father. We don't have to listen to him. We don't have to be afraid of others. Remember, remember uh, uh, um, uh, Proverbs, the fear of man leads to a trap. I just want to give you a, like a contemporary, sort of a contemporary uh, example of that. And then we'll go on. I'm not going to take long. But, you know, back in World War II, I've talked to people. I've read some things. I try to get as much information about this as I can of old people that were there, you know, and, and knew about the times. And I'm not going to go into all that. But in World War II, in the 30s, I should say, back up in the 30s, you know, there was this thing called, it was a political party called the Nazis. It was just a political party. And Adolf Hitler happened to be the head of the Nazi political party. And they came into power. Long story short, he wants to conquer the world. And, and uh, uh, um, you know, Germany was in a, such a bad state from World War I. And so people needed, the Germans needed hope. And so there was, you know, Catholics and there were Lutherans, especially as about a, it was about a 60-40 a, um, a relationship between Lutherans, 60% Catholics, about 40% mix in, in Germany at the time, okay? And so when you think back, uh, when I think back and about that war and the names that come out from those dark times, when Hitler decided, you know what, we need to purify this race, and he started taking... Um, gypsies because they weren't the pure Aryan race okay we need to purify race so he started taking gypsies and he and he would take them off to death camps they would never come back and then uh, um, disabled people they were just useless eaters weak he believed in evolution we need to thin out the weak people thin out these weeds took them off to you know you can't put them I mean how are you going to use them in a labor camp they were put to death and then came the Jews. Six million Jews were killed by Adolf Hitler. Who was there to oppose him? You had all these Lutherans, all these Catholics. Only two names to come to my mind. I don't know everything. I'm sure there were more. They had this thing called, there was this um, Nazi-ized church that went along with Hitler. Then they had this confessing church that disagreed with Hitler. So I'm sure there's plenty of people that did not agree with Hitler, but who did anything about it? Who stood up? They're all afraid of man, that man. It's so sad. You know, Niemeyer, Martin Niemeyer, he had a face-to-face -face confrontation with Hitler one day, and this Hitler had this big party of all these clergymen, you know, and I can't remember the quote. I wish I could. I've heard it several times. I wish I could remember it. Something to the fact that, you know, uh, um, the Fuhrer, Mr. Hitler, was talking about, you know, his taking care of Germany. And Niemeyer spoke up, said, Fuhrer, you take care of, you know, the economy. You take care of business. We'll take care of their souls. And this big split, the way the story goes that I've heard, the big split happened. Like, the, like Moses parting the Red Sea. Big split. Everybody moves away from Niemeyer, standing all on his own, face to face with Hitler. Everybody else is afraid to death, shaking in their boots. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Niemeyer ends up in jail. I think he survives the war, but he with great, great regret for what he didn't do. Remember uh, uh, Bonhoeffer? Bonhoeffer was a, a safe in this country, safe, out of the war, out of the reach of Hitler. He decided to go back to Germany to help them, to stop this madness. He was got involved in resistance. The, he was captured eventually. And uh, uh, two weeks before the war was over, it's winding down. Hitler knows he's going to lose it. You know, this is hopeless. He has all of his political prisoners murdered, killed, hung. Um, Bonhoeffer lost his life. I don't think he regretted that. He was a brave man. He did what was right. Now, Corey Tin Boom is another name, and Frank is another name, and, the, and then the Dutch resistance was, they had an incredible, it's a small group of people, not just Corey Tin Boom, but a Dutch resistance that resisted them. Those were brave people. 
and they knew what was right and what was wrong. They were Christians, not Frank, 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 but you know, these dust, dust resistance, they were knew what was right and wrong. My gosh, killing innocent people, does anybody get that? Everybody should get that. Would you, what would you have done? What would I have done? Answer this. We have a similar Holocaust going on today called abortion. What are you doing? What are you doing to stand up and stop this Holocaust now? That's just something. To, are you afraid of men? The government? That's a big subject. So let us go on. There's hope. Okay. There's hope for us. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We are the only hope. I know it's Christ in us. But Christ is in heaven. We're here. We're plan A. There is no plan B. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are holding back corruption right now. When we're gone, it's all going to break loose. So let's just look at this. Um, <laughs> God has not given us a spirit of fear. We do not have to cower. In fact, in fact, Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear man who can kill the body. Rather fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. God is the person we need to fear. As in reverential awe and respect. Not be like afraid of him like that he's going to like somehow catch us in, in a, some snafu and you know destroy. God is not against us. He's for us. So God has not given us the spirit of fear. If you have fear in your life. It doesn't come from God. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. I'm sure I think I probably said that power first, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So um, think about this. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We have access to unlimited power in heaven, unlimited power in heaven. The same Paul that's about to die, stirring up Timothy and encouraging him in his faith. He has spent his adult life now serving the Lord and has had an incredible trail of suffering all through his life. And I don't think he would go back and change anything because he knew that he was serving God. And he was <laughs> here he is at the end of his life in 2 Timothy. He's not lamenting the fact that he's going to die. He's looking forward to being with, with God in heaven, with Christ in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, he's, and I think he knows he's going to hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, because he served the Lord. Did you know that when you serve the Lord, there's nothing better on this planet. There's nothing, nothing better. There's no better occupation. People that are fabulously wealthy... You know, uh, 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 Bill Gates, uh, George Soros, they have nothing compared to what we have. All things, the Bible says, are ours. Ours. They don't have peace. They don't have joy. They don't have love in their hearts. They don't have hope. They don't have confidence. You know, they're just regular guys with a lot of money. And they have, and they have fears, trust me. Fear of death it hovers over them all the time. And they fight that, fight that, fight that all the time. We don't have that. We have love and joy and peace in our hearts. So uh, when you serve the Lord, you are unstoppable and indestructible. Did you know that? As long as you're serving the Lord. If something happens, it's because God let it happen. Remember, we were talking about grace last time and how uh, Paul asked three times for God to deliver from this, this messenger of Satan that was buffeting him. And we think it was like an eye disease. And God said, he asked him three times. Finally, God answers. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul, he revels in that. He revels, most gladly will I boast in my weakness. So this power that we have available to us is unlimited. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but a power. Let that sink in. Next. A spirit of love. First uh, John four ten says, "And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loves us, and sent His Son to pay to be our propitiation, to be a payment for our sins." That is the love of God. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, He loved the world so much, He gave His Son. 
Um, Romans 5. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5 quickly. We'll be um, just do that quickly. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. When I think about the love of God and how it affects us, what it does for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. If you need to turn there, mark your Bibles, turn there and read this with me. This is King James again. Chapter 5 of Romans, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we now stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, long-suffering. And patience works experience, and experience hope. And the hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The love of God is poured out without measure in our hearts. And so, because we have the love of God, we have the love of souls and other people. The love for saints, particularly the love for other saints. So we have a spirit of love that is inborn. No one else has this. Now, sound mind. He's given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. When's the last time you saw an orangutan with a microscope or doing research work? You know, that doesn't happen because they're not made in the image of God. We are. We have a mind that can be disciplined. We can learn. When's the last time you saw, you know, I don't know, think of the smartest animal, you know, cats and dogs. Can they learn a different language? I mean, we can learn things. We can study things. We can research. We can reason. God says, come to anybody. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Let's reason together. You can think about things. You don't have to be afraid of a virus. I did bring my little blue mask, and I wear my mask in public to help people be less afraid, not because I believe it works. It really doesn't work. It really doesn't do. It really doesn't stop the COVID virus, okay? I wear it because I want to look like a good citizen and make people less fearful of me and that blah, 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 blah. It's so refreshing to get around people that don't <laughs> wear a mask because they know it's nothing. You know, when, when I, where I work, at the hospital dealing with COVID patients. When we get into the lounge, the first thing that comes off, guess what? The mask. We're sick and tired of the mask. And we sit around together, you know, lunchtime, all close proximity. We are not afraid that, you know, we're gonna pass COVID. <laughs> now, you know, hand sanitation is a different story. Very careful about what we touch. Touching our face, touching other people, all that sort of thing. That's another story. But just, I'm just saying, we can think, we can learn, we can reason. We don't have to be superstitious. We don't have to be, you know, fearful of everything, fear of the unknown, what's going to happen next. No. We can see what's happening in the culture around us and where the world's headed. You know, the Lord is coming soon just because of what we see. That's what's happening next. Now, you know, there'll be plenty of steps in between then and, you know, now and then. But, you know, the Lord coming back. <laughs> what have we got... You know, it's easy to say, to look over all this, what we have, and what do we have to be fearful about? And still, 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 I'm subject to this just like everybody else, and I need encouragement just like maybe you do too, not to be fearful and to go on. God is good. He loves us. And he wants the, be he wants the best thing for us. The worst thing, if you imagine, you know, a lot of people imagine this, the worst thing that could happen to me. They're very, they live their lives in peril, in fear of the worst thing that could happen to them. They're always thinking of the worst case scenario. That is not a spirit, that is a spirit of fear. You need to get rid of that thinking. And do not give fear and Satan a place in your mind to control your life. Even if the worst thing could happen to you. I, I remember last, we were talking about grace. Remember Jerry, Johnny Erickson taught her? I mean, the worst thing could happen to her. As a 16-year-old, she broke her neck and was a quadriplegic, has been for 50 years, has turned out to, to be the best thing that could ever happen to her. And she knows this now. She would never trade any of that, any of the suffering she's had. All these 50 years, she would never trade any of that for what she has now. Don't be afraid. God is, oh, he is for us. 
not against us. Um, you know, this sound mind, this is so key. We have a mind that can read scripture. We can understand things. We can put things together. We can see God's plan. We can memorize the Bible. When's the last time you heard a dog memorizing scripture? Okay, listen, we have all this dead time. People that are locked in their houses. Are they memorizing the Bible? Are they reading more, spending more time in the Bible? Hmm, I wonder. You know, I mean, you know as well as I do, that's probably not the case. We could be filling our minds with scripture, the Bible, God's word that gives life. What are we doing? So, um, just remember, I'm going to close with this. In John, the Lord says, um, I've come to give life, and that life, abundant life, real life, life worth living. And he also says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free in Christ, free to serve him, free to live without fear. So God, help us. God, help us to be able to live our lives in front of him, serving him without fear, trusting in Christ. He's, that a, he's such a good God. He's so powerful and so wise. He's got your, got your life in his hand. When you follow him, now you can make God your co-pilot if you want to. That's a bad decision. So many people think that, that they can, you know, we give this, unfortunately, very false impression of Christianity that if, if, you, if you go to church on Sunday, that that's, that's Christianity. Maybe for an hour, maybe two hours a week. That is not Christianity. Giving God control of all of your life. He owns you and giving him control. That is the only way to live. With freely, with power and love and a sound mind. God bless you. Amen.